Hello there friends and welcome for today's BG3 guide we have at last all about the Monk class. And we'll be going One Punch Man style with amazing damage, both on our normal hits close to 50, and of course our flurry of blows for even higher than 90 damage per strike. Monks are probably the class in the game that has the most amount of unique features and trust me, it's very easy to get a non-stop pain train of punch attacks with your monk. With this build, you can get even higher than 10 attacks per turn easily. Your attack chains will just keep on going and going, together with powerful attacks on hits such as stun and knockdown. As a matter of fact, your punches will become so OP you even get to explode enemies all around you to create massive chains of death. Just look at the extra damage stacks go. And of course, you'll be quite decent at avoiding enemy strikes too with good armor class and a great hit point score. So without further ado, let us get into our One Punch Man Monk build guide. First, with all of the main unique mechanics behind the Monk class, because trust me, there's a lot of them. First, Monks are unique in that they can already achieve a very high amount of attack spell round compared to other classes, even at level 1, that's right, from their Flurry of Blows ability. It costs 1 key point, key points will always be recharged on a short rest, Eventually you can end up with more than 20 uses. And well, as a bonus action, you can make two punch attacks. Later, when you add loads of boosts to your unarmed damage, well, let's just say you'll be hitting for higher than 90 damage even. As I said, this does cost a resource. However, right at level 1, you also have another way of getting bonus attacks through your martial arts bonus unarmed strike ability. After you attack the enemy once, and this has to come from a normal attack, right, so a normal action, you can, as a bonus action, make a punch attack. So even at level 1, you would already have two attacks if you don't want to spend key points for flurry of blows. Note that monk weapons are any weapons the monk is proficient with, right? For example, if you were an elf, it will work with long swords which also works to proc the bonus unarmed strike ability we just covered. Just remember, you have to alternate normal attacks with this bonus action to actually get it. Anyways, Monk is quite a loaded class, there's still more to cover even at level 1. There's the classic unarmored defense, which means while they are not wearing any armor, you'll get to add both your wisdom and dexterity modifier to armor class. However, in Baldur's Gate 3, amusingly enough, Wearing heavy armor will not block your most important monk abilities such as Flurry of Blows and also your bonus unarmed strike. It will just prevent you from gaining extra AC from unarmored defense together with the classic monk extra movement speed we'll get later. What this means is if you were for example to multiclass into a fighter with heavy armor proficiency you'll get to equip it just fine, even as a monk. Anyways, in 5th edition D&D so BG3 Monks also get to apply their dexterity modifier automatically to both attacks and damage, unless your strength is higher. There is a lot to be said about having high strength as a monk, because of a very OP feat even I'll soon cover. But with this build we'll get to have both, right, 16 dexterity and even up to 27 strength. As I said, at level 2 you'll get the classic monk movement speed boost, but it only works if you're not equipping any armor, including let's say helmets and boots that are light or medium armor, right? It has to be clothing only. You gain even more stuff at level 2, 3 abilities even. The first is patient defense. At the cost of a key point as a bonus action, you can make all enemy attacks against you have disadvantage until the next turn. It's quite a powerful ability to have if you want to tank with your monk, right? Because it's not just one attack or one enemy, it's all enemies that attack after you until your next turn comes. Plus, by virtue of being a bonus action, you can still do your normal attack and even combine it with Flurry of Blows and other bonus actions too. Second is Step of the Wind Dash. As a bonus action and with one key point, you can double your movement speed. Lastly, we have Step of the Wind Disengage, which lets you disengage as a bonus action. But as a monk, it's very easy to get good enough armor class both on armored and also when wearing armor and shields. At level 3 you'll get your monk subclass. To me the best one is way of the open hand if you want to really go all out in damage, right? First, it enhances your flurry of blows with three different abilities. Topple to make enemies prone, which is great. Stagger to stagger enemies, 
not that good, it just prevents them from taking reactions. And push, too well push enemies away from you, amazing for, let's say, pushing them into the void for instant kills, just like Warlock with Repelling Blast, right? As I said, they will all be applied on top of your flurry of blows, so you'll still do the two punches together with the bonus effects. And you will get another very powerful ability at level 6, as I'll soon show you. Lastly, level 3 will also provide you with deflect missiles, which can highly reduce incoming ranged damage, as a reaction once per turn. And you can even use a key point to deflect the missile right back at the attacker. At level 4, you have the slow fall ability. As a reaction, you can gain resistance to falling damage. It can help a bit, assuming enemies manage to shove you from high ground. It's not that common, but can happen in a few cases. Well, I might already cover this now, but at level 4, since you get an extra feat, Devon Brawler is probably the most powerful feat in the game at the moment, if not slightly OP even. No other feat will do as much as this. First, you get an extra point to strength or constitution, which is why I like starting with 15 constitution. Second, and most importantly, whenever you make an unarmed attack, including from wild shape, or use a thrown weapon, your strength modifier will be added twice to both attack rolls and damage. To put it simply, let's say you have 20 strength, so that's a plus 5. You'll get a plus 10 to both attack rolls and damage. It really is absurdly good. With this feat alone, You'll be able to remove any concerns you have about hitting the enemy, even on Tactician, because of how low that the bonus is. Remember, even at level 4, your monk can already have 21 strength, permanently, pretty much. Through some easy-to-acquire consumables, as I'll explain in the build section. Which just happens to be right when you'd get this feat. And of course, by virtue of monks punching multiple times per round because of flurry of blows stacks, the extra damage from strength will be really good too. At level 5, monks get the classic extra attack, just like a lot of the other martial classes. And remember, for each normal attack, you can use a bonus action for a normal punch, or just use Flurry of Blows for double. Now, this is when we also get the classic Stunning Strike monk ability, kinda late compared to other editions of D&D. And well, it's basically your punch, except you also get to stun enemies, right? And you can do it both when it comes to melee or unarmed. At level 6 we get another boost to movement speed when unarmored for 4.5 meters, together with the King Powered Strikes ability so that our unarmed punches will now bypass enemies resistant and immune to no magical damage. As an open hand monk you also get your most powerful ability, Manifestation of Body, Mind and Soul. You can only have one active at the same time, but it's a passive so it doesn't cost anything, and well they each increase the damage of your unarmed strikes by an additional amount that will also be further boosted by your Wisdom. It starts at 4 to 7 if you have, let's say, 16 Wisdom, but later can become 6 to 9. And you get to choose the damage type too, I prefer Radiant, but Psychic and Necrotic are also quite powerful. Last but not least, level 6 is so loaded because you also get another ultimate monk ability, Wholeness of Body. It provides some healing, which is okay, but most importantly, also lets you regain half your key points for more flurry of blow spamage. And here's the most powerful effect. You'll enter a state of wholeness for 3 rounds, which means you'll now have an extra bonus action, and as if that was not enough, you'll also recover one extra key point per every turn. I don't think it needs any saying, having more bonus actions with a monk is the key to ensure you drown the enemies in multiple flurry of blows for absurd amount of damage per turn. Sadly, this ability is only once per long rest, but it's loaded enough to be definitely worth it. At level 7 you have Evasion, which just like the 3rd edition variant, whenever you make a saving throw against a spell based on Dexterity, if you make the save you'll take no damage instead of just half. And even if you fail, you'll take half damage instead. Together with Stillness of Mind, which prevents you from being charmed or frightened. At level 9 you get a further boost to movement speed together with one of the most fun monk abilities, if not most fun game abilities overall, Resonation Punch together with Resonation Blast. You can use this either as a normal punch or as a bonus action. You'll get to do your full unarmed damage together with applying Resonate to the enemy you punch. 
and then you can use the Key Resonation Blast ability. It doesn't actually cost any action at all, not bonus, not normal, it doesn't cost anything outside of one key point. And anyways, you target a key enemy, and it and all of the surrounding enemies in a rather decent area of effect will automatically take 3d6 force damage. Now it might not seem like much at first, but you can stack this to absurd amounts for a true overwhelmingly nuclear explosion chain. Because ideally, you want to gather enemies together, for example from the black hole, Mind Flayer power, then punch as many as you can with the key resonation to apply it to multiple targets, right? Because whenever you detonate one of them, all of the nearby targets that are afflicted by resonation will also explode, right? So as you can see here, the game even lags a bit before we get to the final result because of how many explosions there were. You can achieve an absurd amount of extra damage stacks, especially when combined with another great Mind Flayer power called the Weak. As I would explain the build progression, there is something to be said about multi-classing away from Monk earlier so you don't get this ability, but on the other hand, like I said, it can be a very fun and powerful tool as well. I'll give you both ways of doing it. While at level 11, you automatically gain the Sanctuary effect after a long rest. And that's it outside of more key points. Now that we know how all of the many unique Monk class features work, let's get into our build at last, first with character creation and the best races. When it comes to race, my preferred pick for a monk is Elf and Wood Elf. This way we get, of course, increased movement speed, which is even better when you consider monk already has movement bonuses, if not wearing armor, so can help quite a lot early on. And movement speed is great for any build of any type, really, but especially melee at close quarters, of course. Dark vision is great too, but many races can provide it, and you can even have proficiency with long bows and long swords which will count as monk weapons. Other than that, there's also something to be said about Tifling, and the Zeriel Tifling, of course, so you get three smite abilities, one at level 3, the other at level 5. Monks don't really have many concentration effects, so smite will be welcome to increase your damage even further. Now let's cover our stats. There's two ways you can build your unarmed monk. The first and my preferred pick is to dump your strength, because there is a very easy way, including very early game, to achieve extreme strength without having to invest into it at all. And it's quite simple, from elixirs, right? The huge giant elixir, for example, can set your strength to 21 until the following long rest, so pretty much forever. The best part is you can buy as many as you want from a certain vendor at the Myconid colony in the Underdark, which, by the way, you can access even at Act 1, right? There's so many ways to get you the UD. This vendor will always sell at the very least one elixir per long rest, so you'll never run out. It's quite efficient and quite cheap too. Plus, you'll also have a lot of other powerful stuff there, including even the ingredients for the Cloud Giant elixir recipe, which sets your strength to 27. The normal huge giant elixir itself, potions of haste, a lot of other useful ingredients and so on. The Dwarf Lady Merchant will become your best friend. And later, of course, for Act 3 on Mars, you can just me max with Cloud Giant Elixirs for 27 strength. Now, the only downside to this is that, well, you could use another elixir, right? Like the one that lets you have one extra action per enemy kill per turn, such as Bloodlust, or to increase your critical range. But I find it quite efficient regardless, because of how early and easy it is to do it. This way, we have a lot of extra points to put into both dexterity, Wisdom and Constitution. And you can of course ignore some of these stats and just start with, let's say, 17 strength. Like I said, I don't find it needed, and you can always respect your character to see what works best for you. So to me, 8 strength, assign a plus 1 to dexterity and start with 16 for initiative and armor class, mostly initiative, because of how easy it is for your monk to alpha strike enemies into submission with their numerous attacks. 15 constitution we can make this into 16 through the Tavern Brawler feat for high hit points. And nope, it will not stack with the Barbarian's ability that grants you AC based on constitution, as far as the Monk Wisdom to AC. And speaking about Wisdom, it will be your most important stat. So dump both Intelligence and Charisma now, add a plus 2 to Wisdom so we can start at 17. Wisdom will provide us with both more AC, stacking with Dexterity, but also higher damage as we get two sources of our Wisdom modifier to damage. 
As far as skills, it's up to you, but since we have very high wisdom, definitely insight. Perception, thankfully, is already granted from our race by virtue of being an elf. There's loads of insight and perception checks, and they are based on wisdom. Other than that, I really enjoy acrobatics too, because of our high dexterity, together with athletics. As even with low strength, like I said, you can achieve very high amounts very soon in the game. For the background, I like Guild Artisan for insight and also the bonus to persuasion. And for the second level onwards, I'll be leveling my character as just a normal bland human to show you that you can really go with any race you want. Most of the powerful monk benefits come from class features after all and multi-classing options. I've already explained the abilities you gain at level 2 and so on. For level 3 we definitely want Way of the Open Hand for the amazing boost to damage. Our feat at level 4 is a given, Tavern Brawler, and increased constitution. Nothing will be as good as this, trust me. And don't forget you can already benefit from your Elixirs of Hill Giant Strength for 21 strength right at this level. Or around level 5, which is safer to reach the Underdark and start buying your infinite Elixirs. Nothing outside of class features at level 5. Together with our last most important ones at level 6, as I mentioned before. Now, there's two ways of progressing this character further. First, you can keep him as a pure monk until level 9, so we get a very nice and quite fun resonating strike monk abilities, as I've explained before, to make enemies explode all around you. It's quite efficient too, considering it only costs you one key point, right? Because the rest is just normal and bonus punch actions. Of course, you might also find that to be more of a win more ability, if you know what I mean. It's not really necessary for a monk. So something else you can do is multi-class now, and ideally we want Rogue for the Thief subclass, so that we get an extra bonus action, which for a monk is extremely useful, right? Because remember, each bonus action will let you have two extra monk attacks from Flurry of Blows, or one from the normal bonus punch. So ideally, three levels of Rogue. And if you want the Resonating Strike abilities, well, you can also combine it with Rogue, right? 9 levels of Monk, then exactly 3 levels of Rogue, exactly what we need to finish your character at level 12. Of course, the downside is that while you'd get Resonating Strike and more key points, you would only be able to acquire the extra bonus action from Thief at level 12, so Act 3 only. For this guy, I'll be going with triple levels into Rogue now, just to show you how it is. Because like I said, you can just go 9 Monk and 3 Rogue later. Sadly, I don't believe Sneak Attack will work, at least not with your punches, right? Because it's not counted as a weapon with the finessable property. But since monks have short sword proficiency, you can always equip one if you want. I just don't think it's necessary. Then level 2 Rogue at level 8. And at last, at level 9... The Thief subclass for the very handy Fast Hands ability for the extra bonus action, which is permanent, by the way, per turn. Now, here's what you can do. At level 4 Rogue, we'll get access to an extra feat, which will only happen if you increase Monk to level 8. We already have Tavern Brawler, the most busted of them all. What I like picking now is Ability Improvement and Wisdom. This way, through Auntie Zethel Gift, that you can get at Act 1, you would already have 20 Wisdom by now, and like I said, we have 2 important abilities that increase our unarmed damage based on our Wisdom modifier for a plus 10. Other than that, level 4 Rogue won't really give you anything. And like I said, you can just get 3 extra levels into Monk now for the Resonating ability. I'll be going for the feat, however. Since this will prevent you from getting the Resonating Monk power, right? Because we only have 2 leftover levels, what you can do now is Multiclass again. First with Fighter. Well, it's actually more like 2 levels of Fighter, right? for the extra action surge ability, which means, of course, more punches, once per short rest. Fighter will also provide you with all armor proficiencies and also shield. Now, there is something to be said about getting an early level into Fighter as a monk, but to me that's only if you went with strength, right? Because this build will already have nice dexterity and wisdom to make up for the lack of armor early game. Plus, there's some monk unique gear that also improves your unarmored AC very early, and of course, if you go with half-elf or human, you'd also get shield and light armor proficiency. And for half-elf, the extra movement speed as well. It's up to you what you want to pick. And at last, we are at level 12 for the fighter unique action surge ability. By the way, if you want higher critical range, 
you can also ignore the level 4 into Rogue and get 3 into Fighter for the Champion subclass, which well increases your critical range by plus 1. So 19 to 20 instead of just 20. Alright, now let us cover gear for our Monk. For the Helmet slot, ultimate this Seravox Horn Helmet for the further boost to critical range, something very needed for a Monk. After all, we attack twice with our Flurry of Blows. You can also go with the Mask of Soul Perception, but I'd much rather the critical range increase. At the point we get both Act 3, you already have amazing bonus to attack and initiative anyways. Mostly attack because of Tavern Brawler. Earlier you can also make use of the Covert Call for the same purpose as Saravox Helm. Critical range increase, as this is Act 2. Just remember, both count as armor, right? Light for the Covert Helmet and Medium for Saravox. As for much earlier than that, just the Haste Helm so that you gain momentum at the start of battle for higher movement speed. Plus, it's not really counted as armor. For Cloak, just the Cloak of Displacement, because although we won't have the ultimate armor class possible, by forcing disadvantage on enemy attacks, well, chances are they're gonna miss, because we do have decent AC regardless. Both when unarmored or wearing armor and shields. And speaking about armor, definitely Hell Dusk armor, even if you aren't a fighter or don't have heavy armor proficiency, it doesn't matter, because the armor will work regardless, right? It automatically makes you proficient with it. Resistance to fire is also great, and plus this is the heavy armor with the highest AC amount, I believe. Very early in the game, you can just go with robes, right, because they won't interfere with your unarmored defense ability. Although there aren't that many good robes, usually they just provide plus one to AC. And late game, you can always go with the Vest of Soul Rejuvenation too, if you'd rather be an unarmed monk forever, as it does grant you an extra plus two to AC. Because it's also Act 3 only, I'd much rather have your armor at this point. For gloves, this is actually the most important monk slot, because a lot of stuff that enhances unarmed damage comes from here. Well, ultimately, gloves of soul catching, of course. Because, well, first they provide you with a huge 1 to 10 extra force damage to unarmed hits. Second, you can even heal your character once per turn after making an unarmed strike by 10 hit points. Lastly, you can instead choose to gain advantage on all attack rolls and saving throws until the end of your next turn, which is absolutely busted too. And it even increases your constitution by plus 2 up to 20. What's not to love, right? But earlier, very early you can go with the Bracers of Defense, which can be found as early as the Blight Village even, for a plus 2 to AC so long as you are unarmored. And we do have enough wisdom and dexterity at the start of the game for that. And later there's plenty of gloves that enhance your punch attacks with 1 to 4 minor elemental damage too. For boots, ultimately the boots of uninhibited Kushigo to enhance your punches equal to your wisdom modifier. And as I said before, as an open hand monk, we can also get even higher damage with our manifestation abilities also based on wisdom. Earlier there's always the evasive shoes if you want higher AC. For amulets, there's not that many important ones. Ultimately just greater health for the massive boost to hit points, by virtue of having 23 constitution. But the Surgeon's Subjugation Amulet found at Act 2 can be quite powerful as well. Once per long grass, whenever you score a critical hit on a humanoid creature, you can make them automatically, without a save, without resistance, paralyzed for two whole turns. And well, paralyzed enemies are pretty much dead. Your attacks hit 100% of the time and are also automatic critical hits, right? This is even better when combined with the luck of the Far Realm's Mind Flare power, because you can then have one critical hit on demand. Earlier, just go with the Amulet of Misty Step, of course, to teleport once per short rest, or the Amulet of the Harpers for the very handy shield ability once per long rest to avoid a blow that might have otherwise hit you. As far as our rings, well, the Risky Ring is as always the best thing slot for any ranged or melee character. You'll simply gain advantage on all attack rolls, right? Which highly increases your chances of not only hitting, especially when combined with the Tavern Brawler ability, but also making critical hits. The more critical boosting gear you have, the better for this purpose as well. The disadvantage on saving throws is not really that much of a downside considering the benefit you get from it. And I really enjoy combining it with the Callous Glow Ring, 
so that our punches deal even more damage, equal to 2 points of Radiant against enemies that are illuminated. Super easy to do by just, you know, having a character with the light cantrip close to the enemy. This even procs on the Cold Weak Mind Flare power, which is hilarious too. Now let us cover weapons and quick slots, or consumables. For weapons, well, I'd rather just your punch, but earlier in the game when you won't have as many bonuses to punching attacks, you can also equip any weapon you are proficient with, right? Because you still get to make the bonus punch or the flurry of blows with that weapon type. But later it will be punching and punching all the way. As I said, you can even combine monks with shields, which can provide you not only higher AC but also some other nice benefits. Now, the knife of the Undermountain King is amazing to increase our critical range, together with Seravok's helmet. It's just that you can't just equip it on the offhand while leaving the main hand as a punch, sadly. What you can do, however, is equip it on the main hand with a shield, as this will still let you retain your Flurry of Blows ability, and also the bonus Unarmed Punch, at the cost of, of course, having to attack with it on your main hand, which is well less damage than our punches, with the benefit of higher critical range, of course. As far as ranged weapons, well, the dead shot is the must-have, right, for the further critical range boost. After all, as I said, you can't really combine two dual wielded weapons as far as melee for higher critical range, so you only have the dead shot and Seravox Horn Helmet. And you really want to stack your criticals as high as you can. There's the Fighter Level 3 Multiclass shoe if you want. And don't forget, you absolutely want to keep a very healthy stack of Heal Giant Strength Elixirs achievable super early to set your strength to 21 once per long rest. Sadly, you cannot combine this with the Elixir of Bloodlust, but you have enough actions as a monk, as is, I find. And later, you can also get Cloud Giant Elixirs, right, for 27 whole points of strength instead. Once again, you can even start buying the ingredients as early as the Myconid Colony Merchant for the normal Hill Giant Elixirs. It's best you have this in mind, since you'll be going to her <laughs> once per long rest anyways. Well, alright friends, so this was it for my Monk One Punch Man guide. If you found it useful, as always, please remember to like, subscribe, and become a channel member if you can. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for watching and see you next time, friends.